from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is John Kelly. I'm a columnist at the Washington Post, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our next author. Uh, the Washington Post has been a sponsor of the National Book Festival from the very beginning. It's in our best interest that you continue to read. So uh, before we begin, I just want to tell you that this is being taped for uh, display on the Library of Congress website. So if you're in the Witness Protection Program, you might want to obscure your face and voice if, there are time, if there's time for questions uh, afterwards. Um, I think of Richard Peck as the Helen Hayes of the children's literature world, or the John Gielgud, or the Rita Moreno. These are all entertainers who won an Oscar, an Emmy, a Tony, and a Grammy. And like them, Richard Peck has won almost every children's literature, war literature award there is, including the Newbery Medal, the Margaret A. Edwards Award, the Scott O'Dell Award, and the Edgar. He's twice been nominated for a National Book Award, and was the first children's author ever to have been awarded a National Humanities Medal. Originally from Decatur, Illinois, he taught junior high English before devoting himself full time to writing, which was probably uh, bad for his students, but wonderful for the rest of us. His book, Don't Look and It Won't Hurt, was made into the movie Gas Food Lodging. His new book is The Mouse with a Question Mark Tale, published by Penguin. And Please welcome Richard Peck. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, readers of all ages. People are always asking writers how we get our ideas. It's the most popular question because it doesn't require the reading of a line you ever wrote. I will tell you how we get our ideas. My sister said to me, I want to see the dress. What dress, I said. And she said, the dress Kate Middleton wore when she became the Duchess of Cambridge by marrying Prince William. I said, where is it? She said, it's on display in the throne room of Buckingham Palace in London. I said, oh, do you want to go? And she said, yes. And I said, well, I'll take you. Don't you wish you had me for a brother? <laughs> Besides, I'll go anywhere for a new setting. So off we went. Uh, and while we were waiting to go in, we went to the Muse, the Royal Muse, my favorite place. And while my sister was photographing the horses, I looked down and a mouse ran over my shoe. And I thought, you live here. You are a mouse of the royal news. And I wondered what his story was. And that's all it takes. And usually my uh, story ideas appear miles from where I live. And so they did. Setting is the geography of story. And I am a writer because of that great moment that happened every month of my childhood when through the mail from distant Washington, D.C. came a copy of the National Geographic magazine. And inside, a map fell out, beckoning to the world. That did it. My favorite setting in London is the Royal Muse, where my sister and I were waiting to see the dress. It's where the coronation coach has waited for more than 60 years now for the, its next moment in the sun. It's where the royal steeds are stabled and the royal limousines garaged, and it smells exactly right. And a story has to smell right. It smells of liniment and leather and brasso and horse, and what horses leave behind. <laughs> and so, I had my setting. I just had to get a story to go with it. But more of that in a moment. Writers need three lives. We need a whole lifetime to sit at home in the empty room trying to hear voices. And then we have 
but it isn't enough to create your masterpiece. You have to go out and market your masterpiece because my readers don't read reviews. Then you need a third life altogether to find the next story because it's never anywhere near you. So we need three lives and have them. And here is the sacred secret of writing. A story is always about something that never happened to the author. Beatrix Potter was never a rabbit. <laughs> J.K. Rowling did not attend Hogwarts school. And Gary Paulson was never dropped down in the great American wilderness with nothing in his hand but a... No. That great American wilderness is simply his metaphor for middle school. <laughs> we look for our stories in two places. The library, because nobody but a reader ever became a writer, and we learn how to write from better writers than we are, and we need to know what's being published so we can be published. And then that other place we look is miles and years from our lives because a story is never the autobiography of the author. It is always the biography of the person the reader would like to be. I'm a writer because I never had a teacher who said, write what you know. If I'd been limited to writing what I know, I would have produced in these 42 years one unpublishable haiku. We don't write what we know. We write what we can find out. And so, a story is about how history repeats in every human heart. My stories bootleg all the history and geography I can get in them. For a 21st century re readership who have not lived long enough to see history repeating, and are not learning any in school, any in school. Non-elective, sequential history and how it repeats. So, history keeps happening and I have to keep my show on the road because we write from observation, not experience, from research, not recollection. If Ernest Hemingway really had fought all those wars and bulls, if he really had climbed all those mountains and caught all those fish, if he really had loved all those women, he wouldn't have had time to write, <laughs> let alone the need. And so, we are often asked our writing process. I will tell you. I write each book six times, because I'm just like a teenager. I never get anything right in the first six tri five tries either and I write on an electric typewriter because I never lost a young reader to an electric typewriter. And I write from the beginning on as if I'm reading it, not writing it. Page one, chapter one, first line. And when I, and I back and fill and back and fill and when I can no longer read the page because I've made so many corrections, I retype it. And when I retype it, I find four more things to change. And then when I get a page exactly the way I want it, I take out 20 words. You can get 20 words out of the tightest page you ever wrote and should. When you're young, you say, how long does it have to be? When you're old, you say, how short can I make it? So I back and fill. I don't outline because that would give me too much authority. If by page 40, the characters aren't coming up with ideas I would never have thought of, I have to get rid of them and start new. I wrote my first novel from three different viewpoints before I got the right one. So I learned early the value of throwing out most of what you write. And then I come to the end, and it's a year later, I don't know why that is, it is, it's just a year later. And when I finish it and know how it ended, I take the first chapter and without rereading it, I throw it away. 
Then I write the first chapter that really goes with this book now that I know how it ends. All the clues are in now because I know what they are. And the first chapter is the last chapter in disguise. So that's how I do it, times 42. And they don't get easier, no. In the first book, I never stop to say, have I written this before? Uh, we are also, we writers, asked how we got our starts. We are asked so often we have to think of something. I write fiction because I was of a generation who learned a lot of history and geography. We had to. We weren't gifted. We had to study. Um, and history gives you story, and geography gives you somewhere to put it. I marched into kindergarten on the day Hitler marched into Poland. But I was better prepared than he. I'd had a mother who read to me as evening proceeded apace. Light the lamp and turn the page and be, oh, any place. Pirates there were and palaces and a raft at the river's bend. I warmed my face at the story's light, hoping it wouldn't end. I had a mother who read to me as the afternoon ebbed away, and stories stirred in the darkening wood. And that's why I'm here today. Today, we're told there's no time to read to a child in the single parent family, in the family where both parents work, no schedule for reading in the family where you can text from the dinner table and sleep with your phone. No patience to read to the hyperactive child. I wanted to be hyperactive too, but mother wouldn't let me. <laughs> and so I wanted to be a reader, writer before I could read. And then when I got to school, because of wartime, the, every classroom bristled with maps. Everything was map study. And I learned lang my language from maps. Tokyo, Honolulu, Monte Cassino, Cairo, and then Hiroshima. This vocabulary of danger and long distance and drama. Whereas at the Lincoln Square Theater downtown, the movie playing was called Casablanca. Oh, the world looks so good out there and exciting. And geography mattered from the very beginning for me. But now I write for people who never saw a map in a classroom and who may not know the geography of their own towns. Besides, a map is poetry and a GPS is prose. Uh, most writers will tell you, all writers will tell you, that it was a teacher that got us going, one teacher. And yes, I remember her. It's almost never a college teacher because we get to them too late in our lives, and often in theirs. <laughs> the teacher who brought me here today was named Mrs. Cole, and she taught fourth grade. There were, she had 42 fourth graders in her class. I counted the heads later in the class picture in a school swollen by World War II, and she never raised her voice, and she seldom stirred from her desk. She didn't have to, because then, teachers and parents were on the same side. And even with 42 of us, they still had us outnumbered. And then all on a given day, and I didn't see it coming, Mrs. Cole stepped up behind me with a book in her hand. And that's what teaching is. Stepping up behind a kid you've cut out of the pack with a book in your hand. And she handed it to me and said, here, you might try this. Notice the verb, try, not like. Adults were not particularly concerned then what children liked, which made us want to be adults. But try was a kind of challenge, and she handed me the book. It was falling apart. It was crumbling away. So I loved it at once, because I hated anything new, and still do. And I took it home and tried it. Uh, it was the story about the two boys on the raft. 
down the river of no return, running through a world made wrong. And of course, I fell in love at once with long distance in the past and language. I ate it up, and it's still on my desk today, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. I'm a writer because in fourth grade, I could read a 19th century novel cover to cover, not because I was gifted, but because my teacher feared no parent. And I, I mention another writer's work before my own, because nobody but a reader ever became a writer. And we learn from better writers than we are. We need all our role models, whether we're writers or not. And all the best role models are dead. And all the worst role models are a year ahead of you in school. <laughs> and from Mark Twain, I learned a truth I wouldn't have learned anywhere else, and it gave me a career. From Mark Twain, I learned that humor is anger that was sent to finishing school. I could never be Mark Twain, but I will die trying. And because of the river running through all his works, all of my stories are the stories of journeys. For me, a, a book, a story, is your ticket out of town. And it's a one-way ticket because we never, ever write about anybody who can move back home after college. <laughs> Our stories have to end with more hope than that. We writers of these books, maybe the last history teachers left standing, we the untenured in our empty rooms, writing real books, not textbooks, writing on eye level, not grade level. There is no such thing as a grade level. And so I fell in love with the 19th century and with the Civil War, not in history class, but in the pages of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and Gone with the Wind, a book that could not be published today, but I read it in freer times, and The Red Badge of Courage. And so, but of course, every book is a historic novel before the ink is dry, especially if your favorite readers are young. And so here comes my newest book. It is something of a companion volume to the one before it called Secrets at Sea. And since no reviewer has noticed, I'll just tell you <laughs> that these two novels both end on the same day in history, in the same building, one room apart. Though it doesn't matter in which order you read them. The moment is 1897. And 1897 was the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. And I wrote it in the Diamond Jubilee of her great-great-granddaughter 115 years later because the story is about how history repeats in every human heart. It's the tale of a young man setting forth on a journey of self-discovery through school and the army and then on to finding out who he really is because you can only find out who you are a long way from home. The story is what is called a picaresque, a journey around, across the world looking for yourself. But in this case, the young man is a mouse. And so this is a rodent picaresque. And the whole civilized world, as far as is known to that mouse, are the precincts of Buckingham Palace, the Royal Muse, the hidden garden, the palace itself. I share you, with you the opening of the mouse with the question mark tale because our first lines are the most important lines we write. Because if our readers don't like the first line, they'll never see the second. You can only warm up on your reader's time if you're writing for adults. And so, I write every book six times, but I will write the opening 
passage 24 to 50. There, I never get the first line right the first time. And I found the opening line of this book on page 124 of the sixth draft. But there it was. It was clearly the opening line, so I moved it back to the beginning and rewrote the first part. Here is how it goes. Every time a human walks out of a room, something with more feet walks in. Mice, of course, who are only a whisker away and everywhere you fail to look. It's true of the room where you're sitting. It's truer still of Buckingham Palace. How busy the scampering world of mice within the palace walls through that mouse hole just behind the throne. How busy the royal muse next door where the royal carriages are kept. Beneath the clattering cobblestones of the royal muse, a whole private honeycomb of mouse passages crisscross and connect. One of them leads into the palace itself. How busy these royal places always are where you can see and where you're not allowed. And never busier than on that long ago June day when Queen Victoria celebrated her diamond jubilee, 60 years upon the throne. Remember that great day when all the horses of the Royal Muse stamped across London in the proud Jubilee Parade and the mice of Buckingham Palace swept out of the walls in a great gray tide across the marble floors. Remember that day because it bears upon the story of my life. This novel is a departure for me because of its exotic foreign setting and its upper crust English accent. But I'm too much in love with the Ameri rhythms of American speech and, and American stories, not to come scampering back for my next book to native ground. But whether I'll scamper back on two feet or four, I haven't yet decided. In his inaugural address in January, President Obama invoked three American stories, Seneca Falls, Selma, Stonewall. Three American stories, three landmarks in our American lives. Three stories our young people need to know that they do not know and will probably never hear in school for the rest of their careers. And so they must hear those stories and a thousand more like them from us, the elders, we writers in our empty rooms, trying to make our brains bleed directly onto a blank page in an empty room, and parents and grandparents and teachers and librarians, adults with books in our hands, with pages turning to our readers' futures. Thank you. Who has a question? What was the hardest book to write? The hardest book to write is lying on my desk today. <laughs> I've got 30 great pages that go nowhere. And I haven't read it, written it as many times as I'm going to have to. That one was, this one is hard because they are getting harder. It's harder for me to concentrate than it once was. So it's always the new one. But it always works out in the end. I, I, they're all hard, but they're all the best I could do. I think you told me that your favorite book of mine is On the Wings of Heroes. I won't say it was the hardest book to write because it was the only historical novel I ever wrote in an era that I myself can remember. It was about World War II, in fact. And it was a portrait of my father because he was badly injured in World War I. And so when World War II came, he felt we had been betrayed and that his loss and his loss of friends had gone for nothing. So, when I went to first grade and saw on the wall, the classroom wall, a picture of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 
I staggered because his name could not be mentioned at home. Hitler on the wall would have horrified me no more. And so I learned two things in first grade. What gets said at home stays at home. <laughs> and the writer's great tool, viewpoint. It's not what happens, it's what you think was happening. And everybody has a different view. That wasn't my hardest book, but when I came to the end of it, I had to leave my father again. And losing him once was enough because I worshiped the ground he walked on. And I'm so glad you liked that book. How many books have you written? They're listed in the front. I think they're 42. I think I've done one a year. I don't mean to, but I, that many. What, where do I go? Oh, wait. Hi. <laughs> So I'm wondering, um, how do you choose your target audience, or do you write your stories and then your stories choose their audiences? I don't know what the answer to that is. I started writing for young adults. That meant the issues in teenagers, high school, people's lives. And immediately I began to get letters from grade school, uh, junior high people. They thought the problems I was talking about for high school sounded great. You know, anything but puberty. <laughs> and they thought high school is the big time. So they started pulling me down. I started, and then I started writing about middle schoolers. And I had taught middle, middle school, so I knew the pain. And then I got letters from fifth graders who wanted to be the puberty people. They thought, <laughs> They thought life would begin in seventh grade. Oh. So they kept bringing me down. I suppose I'll end up in picture books. I don't. But you follow your letters, the letters you get. What inspired you to write A, a Year Down Yonder? A Year Down Yonder is a sequel to a long way from Chicago. And I was inspired, thank you, I was inspired to write it because a long way from Chicago won the Newbery Silver Medal. <laughs> and what, do you, and what, what does your editor say when you have won the Newbery? What, good job? No. <laughs> she says, I did a good job at editing. What does she say? We'll need a sequel, and we'd like it by Thursday. <laughs> and I'd made a mistake in the first book. Uh, you always make a mistake in a book you can do nothing about. It's like parenting. Uh, I'd let the boy grow up. His dream was to fly, so I arranged for World War II to come along so he could go to flight school and be a pilot. I gave him his dream, and he left me. But he'd had a little sister. And all she wanted to do was be Shirley Temple. I didn't see much promise in her, but I asked her, I asked her to come and see me, because I was desperate now. I'd have done anything for some company. And she appeared. They, your characters come back to you. And she said, what do you want? And I said, I've got to do a sequel, and you're all I've got left. Do you want to be in it or not? And she said, maybe I want to be in it, maybe I don't. I'm sick to death of being a kid. I want to make me 15. And I said, sure, anything you say, you're 15. <laughs> and uh, so that made it 1937, because she'd born, been born in 1922 in the first book. And so I wrote the, I, um, I see, uh, <laughs> um, you're down yonder, and it won the Newbery Gold. So, uh, yes. I was very pleased and very surprised, because I didn't think sequels won. Uh, but uh, you never know. Why Grace? did you write books that are all about journeys? Journey, because, well, because I still love the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn the most, and it's about a journey, a very important journey. 
and it's a journey in, from my, in my part of the country. So, I, and I also think you only learn about yourself a long way from home. We're running out of time. We'll ha have to. Okay. I'm a writer from Taiwan. I would like to know how to be a good writer. Remember, if it happened to you, nobody else cares. <laughs> and learn five new words a day. And here are three you will never need again. Like and you know. You know? Any advice um, to make kids love to read? Any advice how to make kids to love to read? Uh, I think our tragedy is that the, the computer reaches them before the book does. And so they must be read to before they can read for themselves. I don't think there's any substitute for that. And it's not a school problem. It's a home problem. <laughs> we'll just, we can just do one more. Yes. To write or read more? What? Do I like to write or read more? Oh, there's no difference for me. I'm reading all the time as I'm writing because writing is too lonely to do without your friends. And your friends are the people who have been published. They give you hope. So, but I repeat, only a reader becomes a writer. Overtime. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.